As we look back on the year 2020, it's undeniable that there is one story that has defined the year. Even the countries that didn't have COVID were major news stories. But beyond the coronavirus, what have been the defining stories from the National Newsroom? Iraq had a tumultuous year as it slid into economic despair after a year of anti-establishment protests. Lebanon spiraled deeper into economic crisis, only to be hit with a blast that left a quarter of a million people homeless, 200 dead, and more than 6,000 injured. Ethiopia nearly came to blows over the Great Nile Dam, while the country's Tigray region pushed the country to the brink of a civil war. A brutal conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh killed more than 5,000 soldiers and 144 civilians on both sides. And then there were the simmering tensions between the United States and Iran, as well as what was described as the most crucial election in America's history. Amidst the flurry of all this news, the Nationals' correspondents were on the ground, bringing you clarity and getting you closer to the story. This is Beyond the Headlines. I'm your host, Sohail Akram, and this week we're speaking to some of our correspondents about these defining moments of 2020. Twenty twenty had barely begun when tensions between the United States and Iran reached boiling point. On the third of January, the United States killed Qasem Soleimani in Iraq. Soleimani was the commander of the Revolutionary Guards Quds Force, the branch of the Iranian military that specializes in military intelligence. He was a figure of huge importance to Iran and its interests in the region. Although Iran and Iraq's relationship was fraught with war and tension before two thousand three. The removal of Saddam Hussein resulted in a Shia majority Iraq to build stronger ties with its Iranian neighbor. Soleimani's influence in Iraq cannot be understated, having built close relationships with key political and military figures in the country, which was further solidified during their joint fight against ISIS. Sinan Mahmoud, the Nationals correspondent in Iraq, explains what the general meant to Iraqis as well as to Iran. Soleimani was a major player in post-Saddam Hussein Iraq. His influence uh, was huge, not only among uh, Shia political parties, but also among uh, some Kurds and Sunnis. He was Iran man in Iraq. He had his stay in forming all Iraqi governments since 2003. Uh, he was one of the main brokers in the process of forming uh, these governments. And after, the, uh, after uh, ISIS uh, offensive in 2014, he orchestrated the fight against ISIS from the side of the uh, paramilitary forces, uh, known as the Popular Mobilization Forces. He was seen in the, uh, in the front lines, instructing the field leaders and their fighters. So uh, it depends on which camp we are talking about. He's a hero uh, in the eyes of the, uh, let's say, pro-Iran, pro-Iran camp. And some uh, and some Sunnis for liberating their areas or for contributing uh, to to the um, in the fight to liberate their areas, and uh, he was seen as a, as a let's say um, a violator for, for the Iraqi sovereignty uh, uh, in the eyes of the let's say pro pro Iraq uh, camp. As Iran mourned the loss of what some considered the most powerful military leader in the country and second only to Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, Donald Trump declared what he called Soleimani's reign of terror to be over. Soleimani had been instrumental in growing Iran's influence in the region and within Iraq, an influence many Iraqis had begun to resent. Protests in Iraq began in October 2019. The majority of protesters were young, under 30, and were demanding access to jobs, clean water, electricity, and an end to government corruption, as well as an end to interference of foreign agents in Iraqi politics. But the protests were met with fierce opposition. Dozens of demonstrators were killed in clashes, but the protests persisted. When militant groups began targeting activists with killings and kidnappings, the tide began to turn. Sinan explains, why the momentum behind the demonstrations had started to wane by March 2020, by which time over a hundred protesters were missing. The protests uh, started to die down in March with the outbreak of the coronavirus and also because of the targeted killings 
kidnappings and sometimes arrests by authorities to the activists. Uh, and in the recent weeks, the government uh, started to dismantle the main protest camps in Baghdad, Tahrir Square, and other provinces like uh, Basra and Nasiriyah in the south. But now, uh, few protesters are showing up here and there, but not like before. Um, they prefer to keep a low profile, mainly uh, the activists, as many of them have fled uh, either to the, uh, to the more secure northern Kurdish region or neighboring countries like Turkey. Iraq's most recent challenge is economic, as people take to the streets to protest after the National Bank devalued Iraq's currency by nearly 23% against the US dollar, sparking fears that basic necessities would become unaffordable. All this within a country that has been struggling with a failing health system. How Iraq's health system started to crumble in the face of coronavirus. Uh, one of these stories told, uh, um, told, uh, told the story about one hospital where dead bodies left outside in the sun during summer as the morgue was over, uh, overflowed. And how people were struggling to secure uh, a medical oxygen cylinder for their loved ones. Despite the dire circumstances, Sinan, an Iraqi himself, sees hope for a better future. The, the, the people in, 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 this, in the northern city of Mosul, the, uh, w- which I visited uh, this early this month, uh, the residents there are determined uh, to rebuild their city after the devastation uh, brought by the first fighting to drive ISIS militants out, and also um, the, the Iraqi youth in general, um, many of them who are fighting for their rights and uh, also who are trying to start their own projects instead of seeking government jobs. Lebanon has also been embroiled in an ongoing crisis this year. The protests that began in 2019 have petered out and an overwhelming struggle for the country's and its people's survival has taken over. With poverty escalating, threats of revolt and IMF talks stalled because of the ineffectual government solutions to corruption and economic inflation, many people thought things couldn't get much worse. Then, on 5th of August, an explosion at the port in the capital city left hundreds dead and thousands wounded, bringing down buildings demolishing the so-called Paris of the Middle East. Suniva Rose is a nationalist correspondent in Lebanon. She walked the city on the night of the blast, providing live coverage of the destruction. Very, very destroyed tonight. Glass is, the glass is all over the street. Uh, entire buildings are damaged. And I'm trying... Now, four months on, she recalls the evening when everything changed in Beirut. Today, the damage you see is still is very much in Beirut and around the port. But the day of the blast... People heard the, the explosion really far away. Uh, you know, it was heard up to Cyprus, apparently. Um, I was reporting two hours south of Beirut uh, in Saida, and it's a coastal town. I didn't hear it because I was in a closed office uh, speaking to someone, closed windows, everything. But apparently people in that town heard it too. People heard it all the way up in the mountains. And, and people first thought it was an attack because, unfortunately, it's a country where there's been lots of wars. And we all thought that, and it just seemed unthinkable, you know, that it was it was it was an accident. Unfortunately, though, there's just so many, so much happening in 2020 all over the world with the coronavirus pandemic and the economic crisis that that created. But today, um, in Lebanon, the main worry is the economic crisis. It's nearly kind of pushed the explosion into the background as well as the pandemic. The coronavirus continues to dominate headlines around the world, but in Lebanon, there is so much more to worry about. I had the feeling when I was following the news on the coronavirus pandemic across the world, in Europe, where my family and friends are, that I really um, was disconnected, that I didn't. And and when I came um, on holidays or on a break, or just for a few days for family reasons, I realized just how it dominates the news here. And it doesn't in Lebanon. And I think the reason is just there's so much more going on. Um, I mean, you have to realize that uh, 
the local currency is devaluated so much that somebody who used to make a thousand dollars a month now makes less than two hundred dollars a month and at the same time you know there's really high inflation so people are becoming poor so fast and so quickly now over half the lebanese are poor and their main worry is about you know getting putting food on the table about surviving and you hear a lot of people say i'd rather die of uh, covid than hunger so they'd rather go out and work um so it's been really really hard uh, the confinement measures that force you know shops to close and and people just and a lot of people just live on their daily you know income there's very little and um, nearly no government support for people who are unemployed or or people who are poor so um you see a massive massive amount of people leaving the country and and a lot of people say that it's worse than during the civil war you even hear that from the older generation and i think it's because of the lack of money because during the war at least there were foreign powers that were interested in supporting xyz militia and would and pump money into the local economy and now Nobody's giving money, and especially not the international community. They say they'll only give money if there's reforms, but the political class will not reform because that's what they survive on, you know, the corruption and nepotism. So it really does feel like Lebanon is stuck. Although it looks bleak for Lebanon, Siniva has noticed something interesting. Uh, the, the one thing that's interesting is that the protests brought together a lot of young people who never really thought they were going to be activists and who became activists and who met through the protests. And a lot of these young groups of people are now creating political parties and want to participate in the 2022 parliamentary elections. So what's interesting is to see if this translates, you know, if, if, if even though the protests have died down, if the movement, the political movement will translate into, um, you know, maybe political win for independent candidates in 2022. And there's a glimmer of hope in the sense that, you know, uh, every year uh, at, at, at around September, October, November, you have elections in all the main universities in Lebanon, and there are lots of very good universities in Lebanon. And uh, this year, for the first time ever, a lot of independent candidates candidates won. And that was considered by analysts as maybe a sign that, you know, young people want independent um Uh, representatives and that had never happened before and and political parties traditional parties really dominate those elections normally you have all the sectarian parties uh, that participate in the, these elections and they were really pushed aside so it's a sign maybe of a glimmer of hope for the future one of the major highlights in 2020 was four arab states agreeing diplomatic relations with israel after deals brokered by the trump administration it started with the uae and israel signing the historic abraham accords in august which assured israel would suspend the annexation of palestinian territory including the occupied west bank and the jordan valley in exchange for relations joyce karam is the national's washington dc correspondent she elaborates this was definitely a highlight of uh, 2020 i think it came as a surprise uh to many in the american public and to the region that uh, we would see such agreements in such a short uh, time uh this is the biggest uh peace push we've seen on the arab israeli side since uh, the 1990s if you remember when we saw oslo and then we saw um the jordan uh peace agreement so it's very uh significant in terms um you're seeing uh you know two gulf countries you're seeing um morocco and sudan uh announced diplomatic uh relations with uh with Israel. Uh I think that Trump team uh looked at this issue differently and they succeeded in a way in pursuing an outside inside approach. Past administrations approached the Palestinian issue first and then uh looked at uh Arab Israeli differences. This administration decided to do to do it in reverse and it worked out for them on the um Arab side. Now, it obviously they have immense problems with the Palestinian side which remains the core of the conflict. So without a resolution to that uh the the conflict will will, will go on. Uh so in that sense the Biden administration will have to renew talks with the Palestinians there hasn't been any US Palestinian contact since 2018 um but as far as what we're seeing on the Arab Israeli scale it's definitely a big uh peace push it's definitely a normalization push that we haven't seen 
uh, on that scale since uh, the 1990s, Jordan signing peace with Israel, and then uh, we saw Qatar, Morocco take uh, minimal uh, steps then. So that's how I see it. For the Trump team, uh, this, this could be their biggest uh, foreign policy accomplishment. For Joyce, reporting from Washington, it's been a varied year. She recalls the stories that most stood out for her. Um, I really enjoyed this year working on the Black Lives Matter uh, protests. It was different. It was, uh, you know, to see a very diverse uh, group of people come out and, you know, call for justice and civil rights uh, because of one man uh, who lost his life in uh, at the hands of the police in in Minnesota. It's not it's not uh, the America uh, that I've seen in the past. You know that you know people going in the street is not uh, uh, an immediate reaction uh, that usually happens here. So it was empowering, and also to see that it was able to to make change to bring new laws, to, to bring new reforms. That's also uh, inspiring because, you know, in other countries or in the Middle East, when people go out in the streets or protest, usually nothing happens. So that in itself, I felt encapsulated an American uh, story this year in a meaningful and powerful way. But the most surprising thing for Joyce has been U.S. President Donald Trump's reaction to his loss in the election. What's striking in this election uh, for me as a journalist, having covered uh, four elections prior, four U.S. elections prior, is this is still going. Uh, you have uh, an American president who hasn't conceded, despite uh, you know overwhelming evidence that he lost. Uh, the race. We don't know yet if he will uh, go to inauguration uh, of uh, President-elect Joe Biden. So uh, this to me just brings um, flashbacks from Lebanon, you know, covering elections uh, there under the uh, Syrian presence in the 1990s. So this is not uh, what we expect from American democracy. And it's really striking to be witnessing uh, this and seeing, uh, seeing American democracy and institutions uh, being challenged. And we still don't know what the outcome would be in uh, the next uh, uh, three or four weeks to come. Because even in 2016, when he started his political uh, rise, it was by questioning the credibility of the media. And once you question the credibility uh, of the messenger, you can then control your own message. And this would be a very big test for, uh, you know, the American public and American democracy. And uh, it's a pillar of, uh, you know, American democracy and how information uh, is, is communicated. So in that sense, he's, he's built his whole uh, political empire on, on questioning uh, the media, uh, because once he does that, he can come out with his own uh, version uh, of the truth, uh, whether it's about questioning the election, whether it's about COVID, whether it's about who is hacking uh, the State Department, you can then name any issue and uh, you can come up with your own narrative once you've uh, attacked the, uh, the other side and questioned their uh, credibility. The way this fake news narrative has changed the culture in the United States has affected its tackling of the coronavirus. With conspiracy theories abound, some people don't believe the virus even exists. I don't understand the conspiracy theories that this, this, this pandemic doesn't exist, that somehow 300,000 people just, you know, disappeared just like that. So uh, that's recklessness. There are definitely, you know, back to the questioning uh, of the media credibility back to the economic uh, toll that 
uh, COVID has left, a lot of people are hurting and they don't want um, uh, to be in lockdown. So that's, that's understandable. Uh, you know, the U.S. economic system itself is not, uh, uh, is not uh, you know, necessarily pro-middle uh, class. So uh, there is definitely, I think, a big section of the American public that's just so tired and exhausted from this. At the beginning of 2020, as reports started to come out of Wuhan, China, about COVID-19, the world had no idea what was in store. Some countries locked down hard and fast and in the long run did well to keep the virus at bay. Taiwan, New Zealand and South Korea among them. But the majority of the nations didn't know exactly what they were dealing with or if it was very serious until the time for prior action had passed. The economic impact of the coronavirus has been devastating. The World Bank believes the virus will add 150 million people to those living in extreme poverty around the globe. Many industries have shrunk rapidly as people lost their jobs and airlines were grounded to prevent the spread of the disease. In the UAE, flights were grounded and thousands of expatriates from different countries waited to go home. Ramola Talwar is a journalist at The National and covered some of their stories. So it was usually pregnant women, the elderly, people who had lost their jobs, and people with medical conditions, they're the ones who got ahead in the line uh, when most countries had decided to help uh, send their nationals home. It was the Indian community is uh, the biggest here in the UAE, and it was the most impacted. There were also uh, the Pakistani community, the Filipinos, Bangladeshi, Sri Lankans, um, people from Ghana also who got on repatriation flights. Around 420,000 Indians signed up to be repatriated to their home country. In the first part of 2020, Abu Dhabi's government flew 180,000 workers home in one of the largest operations of its kind. Prior to flights home, officials and volunteers arranged accommodation and food for workers who lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic. As the year progressed, the UAE worked closely with the foreign ambassadors and consulates to coordinate thousands of special flights. Ramona says some of the stories really left an impression on her. But what really stuck with her was the way the government and community came together at this difficult time. How it worked also was that uh, governments or uh, voluntary groups would ask their citizens to register. But it was actually the social groups, the volunteers who would, actually, who would know uh, the people in the community. They were the ones who would reach out, uh, find the people in need. Uh, you know, help people who could not find, um, who, who did not know how to submit their details online, people who couldn't fill up forms. So it was the charity groups, the consulates, even the police of different emirates, whether it was Dubai, Sharjah, Abu Dhabi, uh, who were alerted when people didn't have accommodation. You know, they'd get people, they'd find them uh, places in maybe training centers, police training centers, temporary accommodation. And from there, uh, they figured out who needed to get back home first. There was one um, a lady, uh, several of them actually, who spoke about how they got calls at 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and they needed to take the calls. They spoke about how, you know, there were people crying at the other end because they needed to get back home. Um, they would tell them they needed to be mentally strong. They needed to have patience. And what she said was, sometimes we'd cry together. And... Um, um, they would give their names out really to strangers, people they didn't know, because they made it their own cause to get these people back home. But one thing uh, that they all said is that they hadn't lost hope. Coronavirus has impacted every country this year. And even in places such as Iraq and Lebanon, where it has not been the biggest priority, it has still compounded the problems faced by those nations. People there, like everywhere else, are looking for hope that the future may bring in rebuilding of cities, in the resilience of their communities, and the empathy they have to help each other. As the world is now looking to the year 2021, they also look towards the added hope brought by the COVID-19 vaccine. You have been listening to Beyond the Headlines. I've been your host, Sohil Akram. Thanks this week to Ramola Talwar, Sineva Rose, Sinan Mahmood, and Joyce Karam. Beyond the Headlines will be taking a break next week. We'll be back with you in 2021. This episode was produced by Arthur Edison and Aisha Khan.